Part 2 Chapter 9 Early one morning in the spring of 1984, three years before Worshi's arrest, there was a knock at the door of the little brick house with white trim on Hampshire Street. When Rick Sr. opened it, two FBI agents were standing outside. They asked if he had a minute. By this time, Rick Sr. had known local FBI agents for years. The downtown gun store he managed, Newman's, was located near the Bureau's field office. Agents would come in and shop for gear, and they would talk. After the FBI formally teamed up with the DEA in 1982 to step up the drug war, Bureau agents began working the gang beat alongside the police on Detroit's east side. The local agents had occasionally done favors for Rick Sr. before. They looked out for Dawn and called her father if she was caught up in trouble, and they once got him out of a jam on a weapons charge, he claims. Before long, agents started to think about what the friendly gun dealer who happened to live on the east side could do for them. Rick Sr. told the agents on his front steps that he was about to take his son to school, but that he could talk for a bit. He showed them into the house where the agents pulled out some photographs. They wanted to know what he knew about the people in the pictures. The younger Worshi craned his neck from across the room, curious. As a corner-cutting weapons dealer, Rick Sr. made a habit of staying out of people's business, so he had only so much to offer. But his son started pitching in with information. Rick had more answers than I did, Rick Sr. told me. Worshi wasn't spending time with the Curry crowd yet, but he had some familiarity with them. He could pick out the major players. It was hard to miss Johnny Curry's tricked-out Berlina. It was almost like a pimp car, Worshi says. He knew some other operators in the area, too. He'd sold his father's guns to a couple of them. To Worshi, it seemed like the FBI agents were up to something he'd see in Scarface, his favorite movie. He must have watched that 30 times, his father says. Seeing the agents hanging on his words, where she told me, made him feel important. He had something the FBI wanted. On their way out, the agents thanked Worshi's father. Your son was very helpful, he remembers them saying. About a week and a half later, the FBI agents came back with an envelope of money. They told Rick Sr. he should take it and become a confidential informant. Everyone on the east side knew that snitching could get you killed. But, Rick Sr. told me, I took the money. I wasn't doing all that well at the time, and I thought it was the right thing. Keep some drug dealers off the street and get paid for it. FBI documents pertaining to the Worshies that I received showed that after a suitability inquiry in June 1984, Richard Worshi Sr. was approved as an informant. The agency assigned him a number and a code name, Jem. He would collect payments, and he told his son they would split the cash. At this point, Rick Jr. was 14 years old. The Attorney General's guidelines do not explicitly forbid the use of juvenile informants by the FBI, but the rules set out age as an important consideration for eligibility, and they call for ongoing careful evaluation and oversight. Greg Schwartz, the former FBI agent, acknowledged years later that if Worshi's work with the FBI had been widely known at the time, it would have been an embarrassment to the federal government. The redacted FBI files don't distinguish between the father's assistants and the son's. But when I spoke with Dixon, he confidently confirmed what other FBI veterans and Rick Sr. had told me. Although the father was the registered informant, the younger Worshi was the true source of useful intelligence. When I asked Dixon if Worshi knew more than his father, he said yes. Then he chuckled. Yes, he said again. I think the son knew everything. Rick Sr. claims that FBI agents and Detroit narcotics cops soon began going around his back and meeting with his young son alone. That would represent a clear violation of federal guidelines since Worshi was never vetted or approved as an informant, and at his age, it's unlikely anyone would even have tried. 
He'd take his grandmother's car at 14 and he'd drive and meet these guys, his father says. Dixon says that he never met with Worshi without the father present. Rick Jr. says that he used to meet Dixon alone in a church parking lot across town, off Livernoy Avenue. At first, Worshi just gave up isolated scraps of intelligence. The identities of the thieves who robbed a jewelry store. The name of a health clinic that was selling illegal prescriptions. The location of a cache of stolen guns. In time, he grew bolder, however, and he began informing on leading crime figures. Worshi told officials about visiting a house that contained dozens of guns, a bedroom full of stolen video equipment, two punch bowls full of cocaine, and a cabinet that he was told had a quarter of a million dollars inside. In February 1985, authorities raided the house, executing a search warrant obtained with Worshi's information, and came away with almost $200,000 in cash. It was exciting, Worshi told me. What kid doesn't want to be an undercover cop when he's 14, 15 years old? Worshi told me that he would regularly meet with FBI agents and police investigators. He says he would meet them far from where he lived so as not to be seen, then ride back with them to the neighborhood in unmarked cars, keeping his head low, pointing out dope houses and dealer hangouts. While they kept watch, he would use money they gave him to buy cocaine at drug houses, helping them amass evidence. Then he would be paid, cash in hand, a few hundred here, maybe a couple thousand for a bigger score. Worshi's father now seems to lament allowing his son to become an informant as much as he laments allowing him to deal drugs. To him, the two are inextricably tied together. One day, Rick Sr. recalls, a narcotics cop who worked particularly closely with Worshi dropped him off in the driveway. Rick Sr. was home early and came outside, but the officer drove off without waiting. Worshi's father could see the bulge in his son's pocket and became upset. Worshi yelled back that he'd earned the money. He had $2,000, his father says, at 14. Worshi's ties to the FBI and police may cast a new light on some incidents from his rise to prominence. When he was charged at 14 with shooting the 22 at the man stealing his grandmother's car, his run could have been derailed early on, but the arresting officer never appeared for trial. Worshi says he didn't show up because one of Worshi's handlers, a fellow cop, told him not to, so that he could keep working with Worshi. The officer said to have stepped in, now retired, did not respond to interview requests. When Worshi was shot in the stomach, he says, his handlers showed up at the hospital right away. They were worried he'd been found out as an informant and registered him as a patient under John Doe. Worshi's father was furious to find them gathered in Worshi's hospital room. Get away from my son, he yelled. The former federal agents I interviewed would not corroborate this story. In all, Worshi estimates, the authorities paid him perhaps $30,000 for his work. FBI documents record less than $10,000, but both Worshi and his father claim that some payments he received were off the books, and that often it was police rather than FBI agents who handed him the cash. Worshi told me that he never dealt drugs until after he became an informant. Dixon said that when he handled Worshi in the early days, the teenager knew a lot and ran with some of the people, you know, the lower-end people. But Dixon didn't think Worshi was involved with the drugs himself. Nothing that I picked up on, anyway, he told me. That soon changed. The money Worshi made from informing, he claims, helped finance his drug business. He claims that sometimes his handlers would save him a step and let him keep the drugs he bought with their money. He would turn around and sell them. He soon earned the trust of suppliers who would front him cocaine and allow him to pay them later with the proceeds from sales. He had a knack for it, and his operation grew. We brought him into the drug world, Greg Schwartz, the longtime FBI agent, told me. And what happened? He became a drug dealer. And we're surprised by that? <laughs>